leader Michael Douglas has been described as a serious loss to local politics. Chairman of the Eastern Caribbean Institute for Democracy says communism is not and has never been the only threat to democracy. And the members of the Roseau Credit Union now transacting business in a new building facility. We'll have the details in a moment. Life is so short. Why try to take your own? Control yourself. Know what you are doing. Be careful of AIDS. Protect yourself from man and woman. Life is worth living. So don't try to get AIDS. Don't. don't. A message from Partners of the Americas. A good idea that works. Dominica, a land with 365 rivers, a surplus of mountains, a wealth of beautiful and hospitable people. And now, Dominica is being introduced to a brand new experience in bread making. Chief's Health Bread is here, tasty and nutritious. Buy Chief's Bread and join the Chief Health Bread Club. Ask for the lovables, it's close to your heart. Eat Chief Bread and the Chief Bread Club will care for you. Communism is not and has never been the only threat to democracy. That's the view of Chairman of the East Caribbean Institute for Democracy and External Minister Brian Alin. Addressing a group of young regional politicians, Mr. Alin noted that the apparent dominance of the communist threat has caused the underplay and neglect of all the important challenges to our democratic rights. The challenge is to identify the Trojan horse, the enemy within, and to deal with it. The enemy is not only within the organization, but within each of us, part of our character. Man is by nature acquisitive, and this acquisitiveness goes beyond a desire for more material possessions. In the political context, it is most acutely related to our attitudes to power. The more we have, the more we seem to want. That is the stuff of dictatorship. The best defense against this tendency is the building of three human elements, character, awareness, and knowledge, and the building of functioning, committed organizations dedicated to the protection of the fundamental human rights of the people and the preservation and development of democracy. The occasion was the official opening of the third annual meeting of the Caribbean Institute for Democratic Youth held at the Anchorage Hotel. The regional grouping, which involves young members of conservative political parties, is described as an offspring of the Eastern Caribbean Institute for Democracy, ECID. Prime Minister Eugenia Charles, in addressing the young politicians, said that part of the duty was to keep their elders enthusiastic and alert. She said also that the task of taking over the political reins and ensuring that democracy survives is also cut out for them. How do you, the youth, continue to keep on with the struggle, keep on with the spreading of the gospel you believe in so sincerely, keep on educating yourself in democracy, Keep on practicing democracy, and there are many people who will try to turn you away from that in the individual work you do each day. Keep on spreading the belief in democracy among both the young and the old. Fortunately, you have these organizations. It is in meeting with each other regularly across the region that you will gain strength from each other, in discussions with each other, in spelling out the wrongs and the rights and understanding these, it is in these meetings that you'll be able to strengthen your own belief in democracy and strengthen your actions towards making sure that democracy flourishes forever in our part of the world. Among other persons addressing the CD meeting were Youth Affairs Minister Henry George and the President of the Caribbean Institute for Democracy, Denison Murian. The man who represented the Portsmouth constituency in Parliament for 17 continuous years is to be led to his final rest on Saturday. Michael Douglas, political leader of the Dominica Labour Party, succumbed to cancer of the pancreas at his Portsmouth residence last Thursday. He was 52. 
Prior to Douglas's burial on his family's Hampstead estate on Saturday, a rally-like atmosphere is scheduled to prevail. At Mike's own behest, the party will be doing its own thing, so to speak, before the official ceremony begins. And that will take the form of a number of speeches from regional friends and, and uh, also people from the local scene because we expect people from different countries in the region and they too are very eager to make their contribution to that occasion. Among persons expected to address the gathering are leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Julian Hunt, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez of the Movement for National Unity in St. Vincent and Portia Simpson of the People's National Party in Jamaica. Meantime, deputy political leader of the Dominica Labour Party, Pierre Charles, says his party is gearing itself for the void which has been created with the death of party leader Michael Douglas. Douglas, who represented the Labour Party in Parliament since 1975, served as a member for a Minister for Finance, Agriculture and Communications and Works. Within the ranks of the party, we are going to miss him very much. Uh, it's clear because of his own charisma, because of his own personality, there is going to be a certain void in the party. However, the, the, the party has met and the party has geared itself up to face that political reality. In related news, the passing of a Dominica Labour Party political leader, Michael Douglas, has been described as a serious loss to the local political scene. These were among the comments made to happenings following Douglas's death by government parliamentarians. We, um, we all know that, of course, this has to come sometime to all of us. But one did not expect it for Mr. Douglas because he was extremely young. 52 is a very young age to have passed out. And he often reminded me in the house that I was old and that he was young. But I often warned him that perhaps it isn't always the old that die first. And I believe that Mr. Douglas would have liked to have um, culminated his political career by being Prime Minister of Dominica. It's unfortunate his early passing has prevented him having that privilege or that burden, whichever way you look at it. Mr. Douglas's demise is a tragedy for Dominica in the sense that we have lost a leading politician, a leading man of the people, whose great strength, I think, was in his debating skill, his use of word, his, his wit, and his sense of humor, um, which I think brought a great deal of life and color to parliamentary debate and in particular to the, to the political scene in Dominica at large. Um, certainly there's nobody in the opposition to match those skills and I think the political life of Dominica will be, will be duller for his absence. Mr. Douglas, of course, was um, a, a relative of my wife, a first cousin, and a, f a friend because um, we um, had frequent contacts with each other in London um, when I was in England studying. And uh, I would regard him as a very capable and gifted individual and a, and a person with strong political instincts. In fact, I would call him a politician's politician in the sense that one of the greatest contributions he made was that he was like a watchdog for democracy. He kept a government on its toes and um, I think his passing away leaves a great political void. He was always enthusiastic about what he was saying. He was not always sure that he was sincere in what he was saying. But whatever he did say, he said with great aplomb, great color, and, and he, he was a great showman in that respect. And so the parliament would be a little duller without his presence here. But he represented Portsmouth for many years, and also from the council, village council, town council um, platform also. And so he, he has worked with many people in this time in Portsmouth, and therefore I think that the town of Portsmouth miss him very much. The first in a family of seven brothers and nine sisters, Douglas leaves behind his wife and seven children. The deceased member of parliament had been diagnosed with having cancer of the pancreas earlier this year a reality which Douglas bravely prepared for as he indicated in a special What About program hosted a few weeks ago on Marpin Television. Because I have lived 
a fairly full life. Um, I'm 51, I'll be 52 um, on the 26th of April. Because I have, if you like, um, dined with the Majesty, had lunch with the presidents, um, served my people to the best of my ability, um, experienced every strata of living, traveled extensively around the world, did all the things that I had to do, and if I can coin a phrase from Frank Sinatra, did it my way. I am not at all, um, obviously I don't want to die, but given that all of us have to die at one time or another, it is perhaps a blessing that um, one could be given notice so that you can, you can, death is supposed to come like a thief in the night. And if it does come to me, um, if you like, uh, during the day, then it gives me an opportunity to, to put my house in order, as it were. Former parliamentary representative for the Portsmouth constituency and leader of the Dominica Labour Party, Michael Douglas, now dead at 52. The Waterfront and Allied Workers Union has been showered with praise for its efforts aimed at looking after the housing needs of its members. The occasion, the official opening of the Louis Benoit housing scheme at Fatima. This development, therefore, could serve as a catalyst in propelling other trade unions in the sub-region to do likewise, because it demonstrates what can be done with good, effective, and visionary leadership and with a membership that is alert, committed, and progressive. Baldwin Spencer, Vice President of the Antigua Workers' Union, as he outlined the significance of the Waterfront and Allied Workers' Union initiative in creating a means of affordable and comfortable housing for its members. The 36 two-bedroom housing scheme project was built on land donated by government and cost over $4 million EC dollars, which was secured through the Social Security scheme. A contribution seen by Baldwin Spencer as the direction in which such schemes should go, as according to him, new and creative ways must be sought to make the lives of the workers more comfortable during their working days rather than after. It is important also that the working people can see and appreciate via their social security arrangements at the level of the workplace or nationally that something can be done for them during their working lives and not just at periods of retirement from active duty. It would seem to me, therefore, that with the number of pension arrangements throughout the Caribbean, thrift fund arrangements, provident fund arrangements, call them what you will, for and on behalf of workers, I believe that the time has come in the region where all these capital must be mobilized and harnessed for the welfare and well-being of working people. And this today is a classic example of what can be done with the funds that are set aside for and on behalf of the working people. It is important also that workers live comfortably in good surroundings because it will assist them in being more productive as workers and more useful as citizens. Prime Minister Charles, who appealed to all homeowners in the area to play their part in maintaining and preserving the environment, also commended the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union's leadership for its foresight and its ability in finding new and creative ways of looking after the needs of its members. So that when people say that WAU doesn't seem to go on strike, they must look behind all of this and wonder why it is they don't. And that is because WAU has the vision to see a long way ahead the problems facing them. And therefore, they talk about them long before they become insurmountable problems and therefore able to solve the problems. But it's also because underlying the, the, the workers in WAU, the officers, the men, the people who lay the policy down for WAU, is that they wish to do what is best for their members. And this is culminated in this project. They're not only looking after getting higher wages, they are ensuring that people are not exploited at work. They're ensuring that there's as much work in the country as possible 
This is one union that is always concerned about whether more jobs are going to be created by the policies laid down by government. And as a result of this, they go further and say, if people have jobs, if people can earn their living, let us show them how to save so they can have for themselves a comfortable shelter, which is an appropriate place in which to bring up the young ones who will follow them afterwards. Friday, May 1, 1992, could well be described as an historic day in the life of the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union. The day the first ever union housing scheme in the sub-region was officially opened. It could also be described as a day of praise, advice, encouragement, and or reflection. This project demonstrates what cooperation could bring about. Both parties recognize a deficiency and both work determinedly towards partially correcting it. These 36 units will not make a serious dent in the demands for housing. However, they have responded to the demand of dock workers. Having demonstrated our commitment to contribute in whatever way we can to the economic, social, cultural, and recreational development of our country, we hope that this will encourage the authorities to fully engage us in the dialogue which could see us making our contribution to the development process of Dominica. We must demand that in that process we be treated as co-equals. We will not rest for anything less. As I congratulate you on such a noble project of such significance in the process of social and economic development, I want you to realize that you have set an example which is worthy of emulation by other trade unions, not only in Dominica, but also in other Caribbean countries. Finally, it is my sincere hope that the union will continue to go from strength to strength as it continues to render invaluable service to Dominica. I also wish to say in conclusion that government stand ready to cooperate with the union in any venture designed to benefit the country. I wish to take this opportunity once again to congratulate the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union. May God continue to bestow its blessings on the organization so that it may continue to attend to its traditional agenda and at the same time build upon the new dimension, thus invoking a new image as it fulfills its mission in assisting in the creation of a new society in which the worker has pride of place. I would also like to, to advise you again, engaging in any pursuit, commercial or otherwise, which would help to spare division in your midst. You would be well advised also to desist from involvement in illicit or unlawful commercial activities on your compound. To the people behind the project, Alvin Serra, Secretary of the Port Branch of the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union, and President Louis Benoit, it was a very special occasion. On behalf of the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union and the residents of the Louis Benoit Housing Project, I um, would like to present this arm shield to you as a token of our appreciation for your hard work and dedication that you've put into this present um, project. Sorry. <laughs> we just like to say thank you. <laughs> Some things in life have been dreamt of, others are hoped for. Some are turned into reality, while others remain dreams forever. But as far as the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union is concerned, its dreams, hopes, and aspirations now form part of its history. For Happenings, I am John Loblack reporting. Members of the Roseau Credit Union are now transacting business in a modern-day building. Their cooperative society officially opened its multi-million dollar business house on Sunday as we hear in this report from John Loblack.
A humble beginning in 1951 to a modern-day financial institution playing its part in the socio-economic development of its members and the country as a whole. That's the kind of description which fits the credit union movement in Dominica and the Rosa Cooperative Credit Union in particular. Such strides have been made not only in looking after the needs of its members, but also in educating the members so that the members could look after their own interest. That interest was manifested on Sunday with the grand opening of the Society's modern-day office building on Queen Mary Street in Roseau. It is for me a distinct honor and a pleasure to have been afforded the responsibility and opportunity to welcome you all here and to be chairman for this auspicious occasion. This day marks yet another milestone in the fascinating history of the Rosa Credit Union, a premier credit union by any standards throughout the entire English-speaking Caribbean from Bermuda in the north to Guyana in the south. This new office constructed at a cost of $4.7 million, marks, we hope, our resting place for the next many years. Every effort has been made to ensure that it will serve the members' needs for many years to come. There are those who think that we should not have built such a modern structure for our members. But ladies and gentlemen, if we must build, we cannot build for the next 10 years. No, we must build for the next 100 years. Those members who have had to queue up on the sidewalk of Great Marlboro Street know that the, know that the building is not too big. The building, which cost just over $4 million, has been dedicated to the Rosa Cooperative Credit Union first manager and accountant, Edward Elwin who, according to the current manager, Hudson Sovereign, is known as Mr. Credit Union, since he was involved in the early days of the credit union movement on the island. I feel sure that perhaps long after I've gone to the other world, people passing along this main street will ask, but who is that Elwin? And they will be told that this was a young man who, from the time he left school ready, and left scouting, became a very active member of the Rosa Credit Union and did his share in building it the society of the people for the people. And the work has not been in vain. Sunday's official opening was held just outside the front of the four floors three-story building and was attended by members of the various committees of the credit union as well as ordinary members of the society who were praised for the support of the movement over the years. Today's event is of major significance for all communities in Dominica. It is of even greater significance to those members that fall within the common bond. As we celebrate this achievement by the Rosa Credit Union, let us reflect a little on the past to recall the humble beginnings of the movement, what it stood for, and all those dedicated persons with foresight and determination who worked so selflessly to bring to reality the dream of a better world and a more caring and just society. This building which we are about to open is more than just a block of offices and a service area for members of the Rules of Credit Union. It is a symbol of the strength that comes with unity, a common need, and a common purpose. It is a symbol of the strength that comes from people working together for the common good. It is a sign that we accept that appropriate infrastructure is necessary for the adequate advancement of our development. The road on which we have been traveling since 1951 has not been an easy one, and there's every indication that the future would be equally tough. But together, we can help our credit union movement ride the waves of the 21st century. I believe that the credit union movement in Dominica is big enough to take care of trading within the movement, to pull up the falling ones for the use of expertise within the movement. We recognize the tremendous contribution the credit union has been doing in mobilizing savings 
and providing credits to members at reasonable interest rates. Interesting too, and very important, is the financial counseling which members receive. It is my view that much more is desired in respect of counseling in many societies. The movement has the potential to encourage the pattern of borrowing which is most suitable to us for positive growth and development. Much of our savings go towards consumer goods which do not generate income and stimulate greater savings. I believe that the credit union is in a position to assist in this area. For Happenings, this is John Lowblack reporting. Save money on all electronic components by Shang Institute for Democracy says communism is not and has never been the only threat to democracy. And the members of the Rosso Cooperative Credit Union now transacting business in a new building facility. I'm Cecil Schillingford. And I am Christiana Abraham. Do join us on Thursday for another Happenings program. Good evening, this is Happenings. I'm Christiane Abraham. And I'm Tim Durand. On Happenings tonight, flags to be flown at half-mast with the late Honorable Michael Douglas on Saturday, May 9th. The Youth Development Division is attempting to rekindle interest in fun kite flying on the island. Officials of the Eastern Caribbean Export Agency, Exceda, singing praise of an OECS mission. Details in a moment. Life is so short. Why try to take your own? Control yourself. Know what you are doing. Be careful of AIDS. Protect yourself from man and woman. Life is worth living. So don't try to get AIDS. Don't. A message from Partners of the Americas. A good idea that works. Dominica, a land with 365 rivers, a surplus of mountains, a wealth of beautiful and hospitable people. And now, Dominica is being introduced to a brand new experience in bread making. Chief's Health Bread is here, tasty and nutritious. Buy Chief's Bread and join the Chief Health Bread Club. Ask for the lovables, it's close to your heart. Eat Chief Bread and the Chief Bread Club will care for you. The Youth Development Division here is attempting to revitalize the interest and fun in kite flying on the island. That division has organized a kite flying festival to coincide with Mother's Day, Sunday, May 10th. The festival is expected to involve mothers in a number of communities around the island. The way we are going about organizing it, again, it's a pilot project. So we are having it in one community in each district. In some areas, other communities will be joining. So for example, we're having one in Saliby, and we are hoping that the clubites, again with 4-H, 4-H has been one of those programs with the Youth Development Division, and we have a lot of children, that's where we touch the lives of many children. So we felt it was easier to work with the 4-H's. And so in Salibia, there's a 4-H club, for example. So the 4-H's of West will be joining the children at Salibia. In different communities, the program will take a different format. But as youth officer for the northeastern area, I can always tell you about uh, mine. What I'm hoping to do, really, is immediately after church service, we are going to have a small presentation. Uh, speak to the parents and persons who are there in terms of the whole idea of kite flying. It's to all mothers, enjoy your kite flying festival. Principal of the SMA, Brother Egbert German, sees a two-day school exhibition as playing a vital role in sensitizing students and the public of some of the activities of the school. The exhibition, which started yesterday, forms part of activities marking the school's 60th anniversary. It involves agricultural and industrial artwork of the school students. We have, though, a three-part thing. We have, for example, in this room, the agricultural part. I must say uh, some things came from the outside. Obviously, as you can see, uh, we do not have all these things belonging to St. Mary's Academy. 
so we had to borrow a few. As a matter of fact, the roost crowing right now comes from Mr. McIntyre's farm. farm. And uh, it shows people, you know, some of the things that are happening here. We do do agriculture, and it was our hope that we would have been able to show the things that we produce right at the back of the school here. Unfortunately, uh, we had a nasty period of drought, and we had to uh, more or less harvest some of the things that we had. They just would not last up to this point. If the exhibition had been in April, then we would have something from our own to show. However, uh, some of the things that you see here have been produced by Mr. Jolly himself in another area of the island where perhaps there's a little bit more rainfall. And since he's the agricultural science teacher here, we thought it appropriate for him to bring some of those things and put them on exhibition. Meanwhile, Bruce Peters, an industrial arts teacher at the school, spoke highly of the students and their response to computers in education. The students here are really interested in the, uh, in the computers. And I think it goes beyond, way beyond the novelty of the computer. Uh, once you sit at the keyboard of a computer, it's, it's hypnotic. It's almost as hypnotic as a television set. It's more hypnotic in the sense that you have at your disposal a keyboard and it allows you to put input into the computer and you get the feedback instantaneously back. A computer allows you to put something in and it comes back at you. And it, uh, The students here, for example, when I open the doors for a tutorial period, we have eight computers that we can readily access and there's always 10 or 15 people who want to get at the computer at any one time. Director of the United Nations Information Center for the region, Janet Bajan Young, is to pay an official visit to Dominica next week. Mrs. Bajan Young, who arrives here Monday, will be in Dominica for three days. While here, the UN official is scheduled to meet with a number of media and government officials, including Prime Minister Dame Eugenia Charles. As head of the UN Information Center based in Port of Spain, Trinidad, Mrs. Bajan Young links up with 14 Caribbean countries. The Organization of American States, through its local office, is continuing to play its part in providing the youth with much-needed skills. Yesterday, local director of the OAS office here, Paul Brown, presented a donation of cooking and other equipment to the Ministry of Education. The equipment, to be used in the technical vocational program, cost just over 5,000 EC dollars. In presenting the equipment to the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, Wolsey Louis, the OAS director pointed to the importance of the acquiring of new skills by our students. The late parliamentary representative for the Portsmouth constituency, Michael Douglas, will be given full honors at a state funeral on Saturday. Leading the official party of mourners will be His Excellency the President Sir Clarence and Lady Signorette. The official party will also include Prime Minister Eugenia Charles, Secretary to the Cabinet Julian Johnson, and members of Cabinet. Other officials will include the resident Peony George, His Lordship Mr. Odell Adams, and heads of government departments. The procession is scheduled to leave the borough square in Portsmouth at 2.45 p.m. for the funeral service at 3 p.m. at the Portsmouth Catholic Church. As a mark of respect for the late parliamentary representative of Portsmouth, Michael Douglas, all flags on government buildings will be flown at half-mast on Saturday. Douglas is to be buried on Saturday afternoon on his family's estate at Hampstead. Duncan Stowe takes a look at the former politician in this report. Through the eyes of some, he was a catalyst for political change. For others, he was an innovator of phrases, an ace orator, one with an astute political acumen unmatched by an irresistible presence. He was Michael Douglas. For the masses, Mike. Parliamentarian representing the Portsmouth constituency for 17 years non-stop, serving from 1975 under the Patrick John administration, Michael Douglas held the reins as Agriculture Minister, Communication and Works Minister, and that of Finance. Douglas's tour of duty as parliamentary representative for Portsmouth saw him equal to every occasion. A tree planting ceremony at Portsmouth on World Environment Day. 
so that we have a problem to protect our environment. And we have a problem to make sure that people do not damage that environment. And it's a problem that all of us need to be interested in. It's a problem that all of us need to be conscious of. We need to be able to say to people whom we see damaging the environment, boy, don't do that. The recent opening of the Portsmouth Credit Union complex. Poverty is described as many, in many circles as a crime. And any effort aimed at its eradication is deserving of the highest commendation. A British aerospace test flight in the Caribbean, entertainment time at Portsmouth on board the cruise ship, free winds, why not? In the political arena, you ask for a candid comment on an issue, his response was always prompt and seemingly meaningful. You could not just have a group of people sitting down in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, what have you, at different times, discussing this without giving it legal form. Everything is legal. The tourist board is legal, the ETB is legal, the social security is legal, the national bank is legal. All institutions that are serious are creatures of statute. And an organization, an institution, which is meant to mobilize, which is meant to educate, which is meant to forward the process, the noble process, we might add, of, of, of OECS or Caribbean nationhood and union must itself be legal if it is to be taken seriously. As leader of the opposition during the 1980 to 1990 decade, the test for Douglas as DLP political leader was in and out of parliament. Here he leads a DLP demonstration in the late 80s through the streets of Roseau. At Portsmouth, Mike and supporters were adamant that his name be included among speakers to address a town council inauguration. The reality of his terminal illness, cancer of the pancreas, however, hit the Portsmouth parliamentary representative earlier this year. This was the cue for a special TV talk show on Marpin Television. Asked, among several things, about his views on a likely direction for Dominica's economic development, Mike responded. Well, first of all, we need to bring our focus on tourism, which after all, I think all of us must have come to the conclusion now, will have to be our major income earner in the, in the next century and certainly the, the last decade of this century. We need to, to focus seriously on institutionalizing a package of measures which will ensure that in fact tourism does become the major income earner. In the next budget, for example, I want to see a substantial amount of money in the millions available to the tourist board or whatever agency for the development and the advertising of this product. How about future Dominican politics? What I would like to see in the future is that we move more and more away from personality politics into the politics of the, of the reality. Um, the institutionalization, for example, of, of, of a three-party system, which is what we seem to be heading down the road for now, simply spells a period of tremendous political instability which we cannot afford. It, is, it would be a terrible mistake to institutionalize three parties in this country and, and run for a series over the next 10 years of coalition governments. Why is that? Because of, the, because of our size, you think? Well, because, because effectively, the pressures that are out there in, in the global economy demands that we ourselves are fit and trim, that our, our machine is well oiled and well greased to, to, to slide and to take advantage of every possible opportunity. And how would a DLP parliamentarian, Michael Douglas, like to be remembered? As the representative of the people who, through thick and thin, stood by his people, used whatever resources, limited as they were, uh, to fight the case of his people, the man who wanted to ensure that every man in the country had the tools available to him to make a decent living. To Mike Douglas, wife and family, death did come, in his words, like a thief in the day on April 30th, 1992. He was 52 then. For Happenings, I'm Duncan Stowe.
Officials of the Eastern Caribbean Export Agency, Exceda, have been singing the praises of an OECS trade mission to the French departments of Martinique and Guadeloupe. Head of the mission, Trade Minister Charles Maynard and Exceda's Executive Director, Justin Vincent, told reporters earlier this week that the exercise was pretty successful. Mr. Vincent also stated that based on what transpired, he is of the view that the export potential of the OECS to the French departments appears very encouraging. However, both Mr. Maynard and Mr. Vincent said that the mission was in fact a learning experience. One of the lessons is that we need to dialogue with them a little more. They need to understand a little clearer what um, uh, our arrangements are. And as I said, they need to know what the negative list is. On their side, we found that they also have a tariff. And um, roughly it worked out to about a 22%. But there were other things that we um, needed to be, to be to examine. Another lesson that is clear is that uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe, I mean, their prices are high, so that we are clearly competitive. We are competitive there. And then I would also say that most important, we must produce goods with regularity, and the quality must be met. We must meet standards, whether it is agricultural produce, we, we see this very clearly, or whether it is uh, manufacturing items or agro-processing items. We all I think from an Exceda standpoint, one of the lessons we learned is that to get the maximum impact on a trade mission uh, of that kind into a, a market with a different language and a different culture, we need to have someone from that culture and with that uh, language facility to, or, to on, on the ground organize the mission for us. We had a, a Guadeloupian who worked with us before and who organized the mission. And together with her team of uh, volunteer uh, students, um, university students, did an excellent job in um, helping us to make contacts with the relevant um, business uh, entities, those that are really suited to our needs and those that are, are likely to do business with us, rather than just the biggest and, um, and so on. So I think that is a very important lesson which we have learned. It was an experiment, and I must say that it was a very successful experiment. According to Mr. Vincent, about $200,000 worth of exports have been generated from the Guadeloupe and the Martinique markets as a result of the trade mission. Business consultant Michael White wants the region to think increasingly of ways to energize and mobilize our human resource potential. Speaking at an ECODEF regional small business seminar, Mr. White said it is necessary since most of the measures we have tried have fallen short of the goals and expectations of our people. But we need to provide young people in particular with the tools, the creative uh, opportunities for them to do things for themselves. We need to give them a chance to use their God-given abilities and creativity uh, in combination of resources provided by others, resources of one kind or the other, to be able to start enterprises which can sustain their existence. We need to rethink development in terms, first of all, of making every individual human being what he or she was designed to be, a powerful, creative bundle of resources. According to the consultant, we need to get away from the long-held view that we are there to be provided with a job by somebody else. Mr. White believes that such an attitude has done a lot of damage to the Caribbean and the third world as a whole. So we have to put the, turn the thing wrong on its head and make every individual in society re recognize that they and, uh, are alone responsible for utilizing the potential that they have creatively to achieve things, to do things, to perform, to produce goods and services. The official opening of the seminar took place at the Excelsior Hotel and was attended by Trade, Industry and Tourism Minister Charles Maynard, who also addressed the function. Former Executive Director of the NDFD, Anita Bully, who served as a facilitator, also addressed the opening. 
The Ministry of Sports here has benefited from the generosity of the Embassy of the Republic of China on Taiwan. Yesterday, Change d'Affaires of the Embassy, Mark Shah, presented Sports Minister Rupert Sarendel with a quantity of volleyballs for use by the Sports Division. The presentation took place at the Office of Sports Minister Rupert Sarendel and was also used to officially introduce a Chinese volleyball coach to the minister. Save money on all electronic components by shopping at ShopRite Electronics and Shoppers Discount. Choose from a wide selection of TVs, stereos, radio cassettes, VCRs, blenders, toasters, washers and dryers, sewing machines, fans, speakers, TV spare parts, and a wide range of other items. ShopRite Electronics and Shoppers Discount, the most trusted names in electronics here today. Dominica. A land with 365 rivers, a surplus of mountains, a wealth of beautiful and hospitable people. And now, Dominica is being introduced to a brand new experience in bread making. Chief's Health Bread is here, tasty and nutritious. Buy Chief's Bread in my body. And it as if it looked like ulcer, but they send me. I'm going to Barbados on a test. You understand? And that was so I said, well, okay, good. And we left. Okay. son, Michael Douglas, um, what was your, your reaction? How did you feel when you look at him? Well, I felt very sorry and as if I could scream, but I asked just as God for courage and strength to be it because I felt that was a very hard one. So I just as God courage and strength to be because I could have fallen down and screamed. But I just ask God for courage and strength to be. I feel very bad. My mother is called Henpos of the Mother of Sorrows. It means during the time that my father was in politics and, and doing all his legislative council and executive council work, banana association work, which she did a lot of work in. My mother was here with the people. Um, every Saturday there was a string of about 25, 34 people who came for their weekly rations, if you like, their tobacco, their butter, their oil, their rice, and so on and so forth. And uh, to that extent, some of the votes, which I still get in Portsmouth, I think, are votes from her. Um, I think I get party votes, Labour Party votes, and Portsmouth is a Labour Party constituency. I get my mother's own votes, and of course, and I get my personal votes. And in the 10 elections that I've run, I've never lost one. So it's always been impossible to beat me here in Portsmouth because of that fact, I think. I feel broken down when I see him. I just uh, look at him for a few minutes and then I go out. Because if I stay in the room where he is, I would have burst out into tears and that would make him feel more depressed. But I just look at him and ask God, just give him courage. Do you pray for him? Oh, every day. Three rosaries every day. And apart from that, other good prayers I know. I put him in the hands of God and I tell God to do what he thinks best with him. If he's to die, let him die a happy death and peaceful death.
Michael Douglas has been a very effective and um, hardworking um, politician and um, minister of government. But um, like everybody else, he had his ambition. But sometimes I felt that he was um, kind of over ambitious. And um, in my own terminology, I would say he was a type of person who would um, give out his best at any given period. But when it comes to, to follow, Michael Douglas was not a follower. And he always feels that he should be where the action is. And therefore, he had a sort of principle to, let us say, uh, he waits for you to make a mistake and capitalize on that mistake, not for the benefit of the party per se, but for the benefit of Michael Douglas. Patrick John succeeded him. The relationship between you two never quite worked out. Um, I think Patrick always had a fear of me, a political fear, which is very much unfounded. Um, I came into the government in, in April, in, in March of 1975, as Minister of Agriculture, um, and, and set out to, to, to assist my country in a very critical area. I remember before taking office, I had discussions with my father, who, who as you know, was, um, was very much involved in agriculture all his life. I had discussion with uh, people like Charles Maynard and Mickey White, who had spent a lot of time in, in, in the Dominic Agricultural Marketing Board um, before taking office. And so I, I was able between us to uh, sit down and work out a framework for the development of agriculture. And if I might say so, um, one is reluctant to blow one's own trumpet, even in the present circumstances. But I think every farmer in Dominica was satisfied the work we did in England on the grapefruit to great, from grapefruit to grapefruit. Um, work in the banana industry, all those things. Farmers are satisfied that somebody's looking after their interests. And I think Patrick allowed the, the popularity which I was getting. Um, he allowed himself, himself to, be, um, to be governed by um, a lot of rumors and a lot of, um, a lot of people who came to him to tell him that Mike Douglas's ambition was to upset him, when in fact my ambition was to work for the development of my country and to receive the, the, the the accolade and the praise of the people for whom I worked. Yeah. Um, not the accolade and the praise of the Prime Minister. Yeah. I, I've never worked for that. That has never been sufficient to, to, to give me the satisfaction which is commensurate to the work that I put into any job that I have to do. Besides this, you know, looking at Mike as a person, I would say that um, he was the type of person that if I am to, to make a cabinet again, I would bring in Mike into my cabinet as a worker I would say that he was one of my best working ministers besides Victor Rivier. Well, the chap was, was quite ambitious and, uh, and uh, you know, he was a man of the people. Uh, he, he upheld, you know, the tenets of democracy. And uh, I think he was one of the fellows who really kept, you know, the government on its toes. And uh, it's a pity that, you know, he had to leave us at such a youthful age, but I suppose this is life, basically. Mr. Douglas's demise is a tragedy for Dominica in the sense that we have lost a leading politician, a leading man of the people, whose great strength, I think, was in his debating skill, his use of word, his, his wit, and his sense of humor, um, which I think brought a great deal of life and color to parliamentary debate and in particular to the to the political scene in Dominica at large. I would regard him as a very capable and gifted individual and a, and a person with strong political instincts. In fact, I would call him a politician's politician in the sense that one of the greatest contributions he made was that he was like a watchdog for democracy. He kept a government on its toes and um, I think his passing away leaves a great political void. But whatever he did say, he said with great aplomb, great color, and, and he, he was a great showman in that respect. And so the parliament will be a little duller without his presence here. But he's represented Portsmouth for many years, and also from the council, village council, town council um, platform also. And so he, he has worked with many people in this time in Portsmouth, and therefore I think that the town of Portsmouth will miss him very much.
all the past people tell you about Mike. And then, for that matter, if you're sick, you know you can call Mike at any time. Once he's present, he'll be there. If he's an advice he can give you, if it's to meet the doctor, if you are difficult to you, you are a little too low to meet the doctor, he will go down to sit with the doctor for you. Then any time if you broke, you're short of money, he'll give you. Some people want a man to give them a million dollars, but the man cannot give what he don't have. But at the time of need, the little that you get is a million for you. And everybody in Postman will tell you about Mike. Mike will be well dressed in, in church. You have a car, you have his car there, something wrong with you. Mike just got up and he take you to the hospital. Somebody will sit. They want to go to the hospital, no matter what garment you have, Mike will put you in his car. Somebody dead, no matter how poor you are, Mike will come there. If you, you people cannot make a drink, Mike will buy a bottle of drink. And not only in the village, if he's coming out from Moose, no matter who he has with him, and he have a piece to take you on his car, no matter what garment you have, Mike will take you down with him. That is what I would like to remember. Any regrets? Not really, not really, not really. No, I don't think I have any regrets. I'd have played it the same way again. Uh -huh. I probably would have not studied engineering, probably would have studied law. I think probably would have been in, in better stead, helped me in better stead. Um, <laughs> you would have studied law? Probably, yes, I <laughs> probably would. But, um, you know, that is probably, you know, the other thing that I... The one once track when Eustace Francis, the late Eustace Francis, we left the Royal Air Force together and he said we should go to study law. I saw law in terms of defending people who were swearing on the road and being drunk and needed defense. I didn't see law in the political dimension and I think that was a mistake. An astute political acumen unmatched by an irresistible presence. He was Michael Douglas, for the masses, Mike. Parliamentarian representing the Portsmouth constituency for 17 years non stop, serving from 1975 under the Patrick John administration, Michael Douglas held the reins as Agriculture Minister, Communication and Works Minister, and that of Finance. Douglas's tour of duty as parliamentary representative for Portsmouth saw him equal to every occasion. A tree planting ceremony at Portsmouth on World Environment Day. So that we have a problem to protect our environment. And we have a problem to make sure that people do not damage that environment. And it's a problem that all of us need to be interested in. It's a problem that all of us need to be conscious of. We need to be able to say to people whom we see damaging the environment, Boy, don't do that. The recent opening of the Portsmouth Credit Union complex. Poverty is described as many, in many circles as a crime. And any effort aimed at its eradication is deserving of the highest commendation. A British aerospace test flight in the Caribbean. Entertainment time at Portsmouth on board the cruise ship. Free wins. Why not? In the political arena, you ask for a candid comment on an issue. His response was always prompt and seemingly meaningful. You could not just have a group of people sitting down in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, what have you, at different times, discussing this without giving it legal form. Everything is legal. The tourist board is legal. The ETB is legal. The Social Security is legal. The National Bank is legal. All institutions that are serious are creatures of statute and an organization, an institution which is meant to mobilize, which is meant to educate, which is meant to forward the process, the noble process we might add, of, of, of OECS or Caribbean nationhood and union must itself be legal if it is to be taken seriously. As leader of the opposition during the 1980 to 1990 decade, the test for Douglas as DLP political leader was in and out of parliament. Here he leads a DLP demonstration in the late 80s through the streets of Roseau. At Portsmouth, Mike and supporters were adamant that his name be included among speakers to address a town council inauguration.
The reality of his terminal illness, cancer of the pancreas, however, hit the Portsmouth parliamentary representative earlier this year. This was the cue for a special TV talk show on Marpin Television. Asked, among several things, about his views on a likely direction for Dominica's economic development, Mike responded. Well, first of all, we need to bring our focus on tourism, which after all, I think all of us must have come to the conclusion now, will have to be our major income earner in the, in the next century and certainly the, the last decade of the century. We need to, to focus seriously on institutionalizing a package of measures which will ensure that in fact tourism does become the major income earner. In the next budget, for example, I want to see a substantial amount of money in the millions available to the tourist board or whatever agency for the development and the advertising of this product. How about future Dominican politics? What I would like to see in the future is that we move more and more away from personality politics into the politics of, of the reality. Um, the institutionalization, for example, of, of, of a three-party system, which is what we seem to be heading down the road for now, simply spells a period of tremendous political instability, which we cannot afford. It's, it would be a terrible mistake to institutionalize three parties in this country and, and uh, run for a series over the next 10 years of coalition governments. W why is that? Because of, the, because of our size, you think? Well, because, because effectively, the pressures that are out there in, in the global economy demands that we ourselves are fit and trim, that our, our machine is well oiled and well greased to, to, to slide and to take advantage of every possible opportunity. And how would a DLP parliamentarian, Michael Douglas, like to be remembered? As the representative of the people who, through thick and thin, stood by his people, use whatever resources, limited as they were, uh, to fight the case of his people. The man who wanted to ensure that every man in the country had the tools available to him to make a decent living. To Mike Douglas, wife and family. The code of conduct could not bring him to oppose for opposing sake. His sense of being a gentleman did not allow him to ape the sound and fury of the opposition when the decency of the gentleman's code required him to lend support to that which he thought was right, even though proposed by the government he opposed. The international airport, my friends, comes readily to mind. Mike was a man committed to national and regional unity and to the integration of the entire region, including Cuba. The fact that so many speakers from the Caribbean are here today illustrates that point. He held that position and belief until the very end despite frequent national and regional criticism. But Mike was not the man to be swayed by criticism. His principles were not to be compromised. His steadfastness led or contributed to the education of numerous Caribbean and Dominican professionals, including doctors and dentists in Cuba, who could not afford to go to the university in the West Indies or elsewhere. In my view, a good mind was a terrible thing to waste, and Dominica needed desperately the skills of the people trained in Cuba. Mike spent a lot of time reading and in research. There was no subsequent earth Mike did not read about. One thing for sure, my friends and comrades, there was no subsequent earth that he could not talk about. Mike also kept in touch with his regional and international friends and close contacts with whom he had established close relations. They ranged from Julian Hunt from the St. Lucia Labour Party, Tim Hector of the Antigua and Caribbean Liberation Movement, Michael Manley of the People's National Party, Neil Kinnock, British Labour Party, the Reverend Jesse Jackson and the Democratic Party of the United States, Fidel Castro in Cuba, and Dr. Ralph Gonzalez. The list goes on. My friend, comrades, amid all of this, Mike was involved in Dominica's commercial and economic life as a farmer, sea captain, huckster, small businessman, nightclub owner, insurance agent, and hotelier. At the time of his untimely death, he had already commenced the development of a project at PCAD, all with the view of developing the tourist industry in Portsmouth. Mike was a loving and dedicated husband and a disciplined father and religious man. He fathered seven children, five boys and two girls, namely Robert, Ian, Hakim, Kunta, Mark, Don, and Claire. He was a family man who cared deeply about his parents and his brothers and sisters. He was a man who loved sports and was a keen domino and card player. 
He was a sponsor of the Portsmouth Rounders team and the Indian Rivers Rovers Dominica Club. Mike enjoyed playing dominoes and cards with the boys, my friends. Playing little politics, he once called it. But nothing gave him more joy than to give Jojo, Gerard, or Wayne blows in dominoes. We would hear his laughter and cries of joy from some distance away whenever he would give them a love or when he would put blows on Stafford or Iman in a card game. Within seconds, Mike would come up to us and give us a ball-by-ball -ball commentary of the blows, his body shaking with laughter and emotion. Well, my friends, comrades, who can forget Spark? The super political action that Mike was properly known as. At his house at Indian River Inn at Portsmouth, Mike and his dear wife, Nurse Douglas, maintained an open door policy 24 hours a day, from christenings to funerals, for jobs, references or visas, for song advice on any personal affair, or business or insurance matter, or, ch or chastisement, for a friendly chat or political discussion in sickness or in health, Mike was there. Taking care of the people's business without fear or favor, and regardless of whether or not you are his political supporter. After 23 years, no man, woman, or child can ever say that they were turned away from the doors of Mike. Every one of us can lay claim to have left a fingerprint or a footprint somewhere in Mike's house. Super political action, far, that says it all. Mike's love of life and vibrant way in which he lived it was recalled by his dear and beloved friend and comrade, Tim Hector, in the outlet newspaper of Antigua. Tim also, Tim also spoke of the philosophical context of Mike's death. He said, until the news came of Mike's similar illness, nothing about him suggested death. There is a whole school of modern philosophy known as existentialism, which suggests that life is absurd, utterly meaningless. To me, Mike was the living contradiction of that notion of the absurdity, or to borrow a phrase from the existentialist thought, the notion of existence. Mike Douglas had an essentially Douglas, if not Caribbean trait, a sense of vivacity, a sense of the enjoyment of life, a sense of life as something to be savored. A sense of life as a cup in the woods of Tennessee, a cup from, win from which to drink life to the lees. A sense that adversity was only an obstacle to be hurled over for the better enjoyment of lifestyle. Mike symbolized the Caribbean worldview, the sense of life as sunlight, the light of optimism, of optimism and hope springing eternal. His sudden death shocked us all the more, reminding us that light and darkness are inseparable that in the midst of life we are in fact in death, that life and death are the dialect of being, that is, the enduring unity of opposites. Well said, Tim. But I believe that Mike himself summed up his life best when at the 1990 Dominica Labour Party convention he said, while we are passing through our country, if there is something we can do for our country, do it now, because we may never pass this way again. Mike did it, and he did it well. Thank you. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine on him. May he rest in peace. Long live Mike. That album has been exposed to you here today as we celebrate the life of my father and mourn his untimely death. We, as his family, express our humble gratitude to you that helped us carry that mourning and grief here today. Every time we looked at his face and body, memories spring to mind of him as the best husband and father we could in our wildest dreams have hoped for. As the best friend we could ever have, the most solid rock we could cling to, the firmest and best leader and teacher, fashioned in his own likeness by the Almighty. The power of my father over us was immense. What you see before you as his family are literally a partnership in creation between God and him. We, as his family, had strove and worked out of love for him and in a need to please him with our work and ourselves. To say that he will be missed by us is a gross understatement. To say that a part of us will be buried today is a fact. To say thank you to him now 
is not enough. Daddy, we will try to live out our thanks for the rest of our lives until we join you in a better place. There was a lot of effort put into today's activity, which must not go unthanked. We would like to thank everyone who helped and are continuing to help today. From the bottom of our hearts, we thank everyone. In the years to come, we will look back on today as an impetus to try to deserve even a fraction of what daddy got here today. I do not want to only thank people for today because today is a continuation of a process which started when we were all shocked to the core with the news of daddy's illness. The thanks that we would like to offer are as many as the sons on the seashore, the stars above. They are, every one of them, heartfelt and sincere. They go out initially from our immediate family, my mother, Olivia, my brothers, Robert and Hakim, Mark in the States and Gabriel, and sisters, John and Claire. And I extend it to every single one of you. There are, however, certain ones of you who throughout this traumatic ordeal have provided us with the strength and support which has sustained us up till today. Where do we begin? The members of our extended family who were able to make extraordinary sacrifices in the name of family love and togetherness. To mention names here would be foolish and fruitless. But every finger that was lifted was noted and appreciated deeply. Our thanks to you are boundless and everlasting. Tony Astafan now seems like one of our own family. So close has he become in the support he has extended to us. Tony, we all say thanks to you. My father had one mainstay in his life this past few weeks. That was his realization of the acquaintance with God. For this, I thank all those who were able to offer their faith and hope to Daddy. As a soothing power and a source of strength to the very end. All the prayers offered up for him by Fathers August, Father Moody, and other priests who visit him regularly. Meryl Wallace and the members of his religious community and everyone who deepened my father's faith with every faltering breath. The staff at the Princess Margaret Hospital are a tremendous credit to our country. And my father was impressed and overwhelmed with the gratitude at the care taken over him. So are we, all the doctors and nurses.
Boy, so it is, boy. <coughs> 